So my name is Nick Embleton and I'm going to be spending the next 20 minutes talking about nutrition interventions to improve brain outcomes in preterm infants. And in this talk, I'm going to cover some concepts around what is nutrition, what do we mean by nutrition, talk a bit about brain growth and then something around nutritional interventions to improve brain outcomes. And just to note on the right side of the screen there, I have received research funding for a number of organisations including some industrial companies as well. And in the talk, I'll be touching on some of these nutrients towards the end that appear in breast milk. So the most important concept is to recognize that nutrition is more than simply nutrients. Of course, we need all the proteins, fats, and micronutrients in our diet. But in recent years, we've started to recognize the importance of all these functional components, particularly HMOs, growth factors, and other enzymes. In addition, over the last 10 or 20 years, we started to recognize the real importance of the microbes that live in the gastrointestinal tract. And these may be promoted by breast milk or affected by the NICU environment, but clearly there are other interventions like probiotics and all of these impact on nutrient assimilation. And then final part of nutrition are the technical or the socio-behavioral aspects. And this might be aspects of how we give bolus or continuous feed, uh, skin to skin, breastfeeding, sensory aspects of, of uh, nutrition. So all of these four components are important when we think about nutritional interventions. Now brain growth in early life is very rapid, but we're quite different to most other primates. In most primates, the rapid period of brain growth happens prior to delivery. But in humans, around 90% of final brain volume is acquired between 24 weeks gestation and two years of life when we as neonatologists look after them. And this is important because humans have a very large brain and in comparison to a rhinoceros that you see here with a very large head, but actually quite a small brain, humans have a brain that fills the entire cranial cavity. And when we look at body weight versus brain weight for all the different animals and note that these are logarithmic scales here, you see that humans are off uh, the normal line, that humans have a brain that is about 10 or 20 times as big as every other mammal. And therefore everything about placental growth, feeding, nutrition, and breast milk and early life is designed to protect and promote brain growth in babies. And during this period of very rapid brain growth, there are lots of very important um, aspects happening. So throughout all three trimesters of pregnancy, we have neuronal migration. We have the programming of cell death, apoptosis, that is particularly active in the second and third trimesters and in the first few months after life. Synaptogenesis that only really initiates towards the end of the second and the third trimesters, but continues until infancy, a myelination that may not complete until adult life. And we now know that there is good evidence to show that many of these processes are under the control of IGF-1 and in turn, intake of nutrients, particularly macronutrients, seem to impact on levels of IGF-1. So there are direct links now between nutrition and brain processes. Now, brain growth in preterm babies is vulnerable to damage, particularly cystic PVL and hemorrhage. And when we want to repair those tissues, the baby is gonna need higher intakes, both of the substrates but also the energy to drive these processes. Because humans have a very large brain with very high demands, it's therefore quite easy to malnourish these babies. And again, in more recent years, we started to recognize the importance of the cerebellum. And in fact, this undergoes much more rapid growth than the actual cortex of the brain. And studies have started to show how different growth of the cerebellum might be in preterm babies compared to babies born at term. And so there's altered development going on, as well as evidence of changes on the MRI. And the vulnerability of this growing brain to babies is particularly uh, important when we consider um, aspects such as nectarizing enterocolitis and sepsis, when we get an inflammatory storm. And the various cytokines produce activate TLRs on the surface of the microglial cells. And then we get damage to the axons and neurons. Um, but furthermore, cytokines will suppress growth factors and particularly IGF-1. So how do nutrient deficiencies impact on brain development? Well, it depends on the amount of the nutrient, the type of nutrient, 
timing and duration. And you can imagine in each of those three different scenarios, you'll have a different outcome. So there are multiple nutrients. We're looking after babies with a changing diet, both PN and enteral nutrition, lots of developmental stages and lots of mechanisms. And it's important that we remember that none of these nutrients work in isolation. They all require cofactors, enzymes, and energy to drive the process. And therefore a healthy brain requires every nutrient. It's not the case that there's just a single nutrient that makes the difference. Now, demand for macronutrients is particularly high in preterm babies. Here I show you a photo of Vigan Bernal who won the Tour de France a couple of years ago. And he consumes around about 100 kilocalories a kilo a day to cycle up and down mountains. In comparison, our babies on the neonatal unit require an energy intake of around 120 to 130 kilocalories a kilo a day. And therefore we are expecting our babies to do something that is about 20 to 30% more energy intense than the most intense sporting activity known to man. And most of that energy expenditure is happening in the brain. So energy intakes are particularly important in our babies. So let's just think about how nutrition could impact on brain development. Well, of course, we need nutrition for we need nutrients for tissue substrates. That's all of your macro and micronutrients. We need energy to drive the system, particularly carbohydrate and lipids, but also protein if there's not enough energy there. There's a whole range of signaling factors, mTOR. There's a whole range of sphingomyelins and phospholipids and IGF-1 that might be involved in signaling and growth factors. We know that lots of nutrients, particularly folate, B12 and iron, impact on gene expression and epigenetic processes. We know that brass milk prevents disease that prevents the cytokine storm that damages the brain. And finally, we're starting to learn the importance of the gut-brain access. We're only just starting to get an idea of how prebiotics and oligosaccharides and lactoferrin may impact on brain development in these babies. Now, all of you will recognize that neonatal care is very complex. And most of what we do is focused around cardiorespiratory management. But unfortunately, within all of this complexity, there is then a lack of focus on, on nutrition. And it's quite easy to fail to give babies adequate levels of macronutrients. So just as a quick brain cap, uh, recap, I've told you that brain growth is very rapid. We have one brain for life. The impact of nutrient deficiency on the brain depends on the amount, type, timing, and duration. The NICU environment is complex and poor nutritional status is common. And poor out brain outcome is quite common in our babies. And there is always going to be a question of whether this is due to macronutrients or micronutrients or something like this. So I just want to show you this audit data we collected now uh, more than 20 years ago. And each of these yellow bars depicts the three gram protein intake that we would recommend a baby has on each day of life. And of course, now we're recommending intake close to four grams. But that, that yellow bar represents the three grams that the baby should be getting. In green, I show you the amount the babies actually get on each day. And then the red bar represents the difference between the amount they should be getting in yellow and the amount they actually get in, in green. So the red is the deficit that the baby gets each day. And if you add these deficits over time, you can see that by the end of the second week, babies have accrued a deficit of protein round about equivalent to about 60 to 70% of their needs. This is a huge deficit in macronutrients that the babies receive. And part of the problem is that on the NICU, all of your monitoring is focused on cardiorespiratory management. And there aren't any monitors or feedback systems that alert you to the invisibility of malnutrition. So what's the evidence that mal macronutrients matter? Well, I'm going to show you four bits of data quite quickly over the next few slides that link macronutrient intakes to developmental outcomes or retinopathy of prematurity. The first one is a study from Bonnie Stevens looking at 124 babies, less than 1,000 grams, where they used multiple regression to adjust the data for all the likely confounders, including illness severity. And what they show is that for every extra 10 kilocalories a kilo a day of energy in the first week of life, there's a four and a half point benefit in developmental outcome at 18 months of age. And for every gram of protein, there's an 8.2 MDI benefit at 18 months of age. The next bit of data comes from a large Swedish study of very tiny babies, less than 27 weeks. They also show that intakes are less than recommended. But what they showed was a tight relationship between the amount of energy and the risk of retinopathy. 
And what they show here on the left is that for every extra 10 calories a kilo the baby receives during the first four weeks of life, there is a 24% reduction in retinopathy after controlling for all the likely confounders. And the likely mechanisms are going to be complex, but are probably modulated through IGF-1, whereby low energy intakes further suppress IGF-1 that arrest vascularization and therefore increase the risk of retinopathy. This is a Norwegian study that was stopped early and was a postnatal nutrient enhancement study using both PN and enteral nutrition, where they gave higher amounts of amino acids, lipids, and DHA, and then they conducted MRI. And what they showed was that the enhanced nutrient group grew faster. They put on more weight, 16.5 versus 13.8, and they had larger heads. But the most impressive finding were these differences on the MRI. And here I show you in green the normal white matter skeleton in the skull. But picked out in orange here is the difference between the high nutrient and the standard nutrient groups, particularly in this one part of the brain, the superior longitudinal fasciculus, which is involved in motor control, perception, and language. And here is the final bit of data that links macronutrient intakes to brain growth. And this is a subset from one of Alan Lucas's very large trials where babies were randomized with a standard nutrient or high nutrient diet. And what they did was take babies or children who were neurologically normal at eight years of age, and they conducted a vesicular and an MRI at 16 years of age. And what they show on the right here is that verbal IQ in the high nutrient group is significantly greater at 16 years of age compared to in the standard group. So this is after an outcome that only lasted for a few weeks, they can still see a difference 16 years later. When they look at brain volume, it's interesting that actual overall brain volume doesn't differ, but you'll see on the bottom there a significant difference in the size of the chordate nucleus. And this is known to be an area important in memory and learning that seems to be particularly vulnerable to nutrition. So 16 years later, we can see changes in the MRI that relate to early nutrition. Now, there are lots of macronutrients and micronutrients that might be important here. Preterm infants are at risk of iron deficiency because of levels in low levels in breast milk, but also uh, frequent blood testing. But there's never been a good RCT. However, expert consensus is that you should be starting iron at between two and four weeks of age around about two or three milligrams a kilo a day, but you can delay supplementation if babies have had a recent transfusion. There are lots of other metals that are important. So zinc is involved in lots of processes, particularly involved in protein synthesis and IGF-1 expression. Um, we know that there are interactions between the metals such as copper and iron, um, and clearly other uh, components such as iodine are um, essential. But overall, there are no really good RCTs that will help us determine the exact levels. But we know that all of these micronutrients are going to be important in the diet. But there's no current evidence suggesting that we should be giving higher intakes to our babies. So the most important aspects of nutrition so far that we've touched on are the importance of macronutrient intakes and energy to drive the system. But in the last part of the talk, I'm just gonna focus on the importance of breast milk and why breast milk might be important. And for all these four potential mechanistic links between nutrition and the brain, this is really where breast milk comes into play. So again, this is data from Alan Lucas's studies where they looked at adolescents at 15 years of age who are neurologically normal and they conducted cognitive assessments and brain MRIs. And what they showed was that the strongest predictors of late IQ with social class, but also the amount of breast milk. So the amount of breast milk that babies had on the neonatal unit was associated 15 years later with verbal and full-scale IQ, white matter volume, and there was clearly a dose response effect. The more mother's breast milk you get, the better your outcome. This is data from a very large uh, French cohort, almost 3000 babies born less than 32 weeks. They show that these babies on breast milk actually tend to grow a little bit more slowly than those getting formula. And in this large cohort, they conducted neurodevelopmental testing at two years of age. And what they show on the right here is that babies who get no mother's own milk compared to some mother's own milk do worse. That as you go up, the longer duration of mother's own milk results in a better developmental outcome. So that babies who continue to receive mother's own milk for more than two months after NICU discharge 
have the best developmental outcomes at two years of age. People have often wondered whether supplanting uh, donor milk in place of formula milk, uh, whether it's a short form, might improve developmental outcome. And this was a study from Deb O'Connor's group in Canada about four years ago of almost uh, 400 babies, randomizing them to either getting donor milk or formula if there was a short form in mum's own milk. And the primary outcome of this study was neurodevelopment. And what I show you on the right here is that overall, there was no difference in developmental outcome at two years of age for any of the domains, depending on whether you had donor milk or formula. And if anything, there appears to be a very slight benefit perhaps uh, for babies getting formula. So no justification to give donor milk in, as a means of improving brain outcomes in these babies. Now, many of you will be aware of the critical importance of um, essential fatty acids, so particularly docose hexanoic acid and arachidonic acid with very high uptakes in the third trimester. Preterm infants are at high risk of deficiency because of the lack of placental supply and low fat stores and immature digestive functions. There have been a number of trials that are summarized in a Cochrane meta-analysis of supplementing LC poovers into formula milk but overall, there are no clear benefits that have been shown in this type of analysis. But there is, however, strong theoretical basis for giving adequate amounts of DHA. So people sometimes wonder whether we should just give uh, babies some extra. But here we need to exercise some caution. This was a study from Carmel Collins in, in uh, Australia a few years back where they supplemented babies with extra DHA, um, hoping that they would see a reduction in the incidence of lung disease. In fact, what they saw was a slight increase in the risk of BPD with additional supplements of DHA. And in a further trial published last year from a Canadian group, I think, here they actually gave the mother DHA supplements in order to increase the amount of um, DHA in breast milk. Again, they also hoped they might see a reduction in BPD, but they didn't see this. And again, similar to the previous study, it almost appeared that they had more BPD and the trial was stopped early in the, in the mothers getting uh, DHA. So whilst DHA is essential as a nutrient, we need to be cautious about simply adding more into the baby's diet. But there is some uh, uh, hope in, in the use of fatty acids. This is a very recent trial from uh, Anne Hellstrom's group published this year in JAMA, where they took about 200 very small babies, randomized to additional arachidonic acid and DHA from day three. And they looked at ROP and what they showed was a significantly lower incidence of ROP in the babies getting the fatty acid supplement. So clearly we need much more work and there is reason to hope that extra DHA or arachidonic acid might be important. Um, and I'm just gonna finish off mentioning choline. This is a very important nutrient, a bit like a B vitamin. Uh, heavily involved in DNA methylation. It's a precursor of acetylcholine involved in neuronal proliferation and migration, but also um, animal evidence, particularly say in rats, showing that maternal choline supplementation improves outcomes um, in their offspring. And there have been, uh, has been a lot of interest in this over recent years. And Morag Andrew here about five years ago published this small RCT in preterm babies, but also term babies with brain injury who are randomized to getting extra choline, uh, DHA, and a nucleotide base with a primary outcome at two years of age. And here on the right, you'll see the differences. So in red, the differences at 24 months of age, which are the most important, showing borderline significant improvement for cognitive outcome in the babies getting the extra choline and DHA. Um, and that we felt was sufficiently encouraging um, that we should do a larger trial. So we have now plans and have funding for a large trial of choline and DHA supplementation that will recruit over a thousand babies uh, from about 30 hospitals across the UK, where we will randomize babies less than 28 weeks, or those with a term uh, brain injury requiring HIE, to getting a nutrient supplement or placebo with outcomes at 24 months of age. So uh, watch this space for the trial that hopefully will start early next year. Now I haven't covered uh, pre and probiotics or the gut brain access in this talk, but clearly there are lots of elements there that might be important and might link nutrition and brain outcomes. 
And I've really mainly focused on the very preterm babies less than 32 weeks, but I want to highlight that babies between 32 and 36 weeks are also vulnerable to malnutrition. And that babies born, for example, at 34 weeks only have a brain size that is about two thirds that of a term baby. So again, a very important group. So as neonatal care progresses, we get uh, better focused on the importance of nutrition. This certainly improves survival in our babies. But in turn, as more babies survive, the importance of nutrition becomes even greater um, and the challenges become more complex. So in summary, uh, very strong evidence that mother's own milk improves brain outcomes in babies, but that does not apply to donor human milk. Very strong evidence that protein and energy uh, do relate to outcomes, although there's likely to be an upper limit of benefit. Lots of theoretical reasons why you need to make sure the babies have adequate iron, zinc and selenium and some emerging potentially promising evidence around the role of DHA and choline, but we need more work. But in summary, uh, the two things to do are maximize mother's own milk and make sure you meet macronutrient intakes. And finally, you know, why is it that mother's own milk is so important? Well, we used to think that milk was just this inert fluid that you tip through the gut and produced a waste product at the far end. But we're now starting to understand the complexities of all the metabolites and immune processes that are involved here. And uh, many groups, including us, have got very interested in how these link between brain outcomes and other diseases such as neck. So as I say, we've started to recognize that brass milk is more than simply food. And on the left here, you can see all the different components that appear in formula milk. But appearing here in colors are all the things that you get in mother's own milk that perhaps don't appear in fauna milk and a whole range of uh, prostacyclins and fatty acids, phospholipids, nucleotides, uh, sphingolipids, lots of cholesterol and steroid compounds, lots of vitamins and amino acids, uh, but importantly, lots of these growth factors like IGF-1, IGF-2, uh, thyroxine, insulin, adiponectin. So breast milk really is incredibly complex and undoubtedly holds the key to improve brain outcomes um, in the babies that we're looking after here. And I'm going to finish there and thank you very much for your attention and look forward to taking any questions. So thank you very much indeed. Uh, just to summarize again, importance of mother's own milk and macronutrient intakes and to thank all my collaborators, both here in Newcastle and further afield who have helped us with our research. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Professor Nadia Hayden. Nadia is Professor of Pediatrics, Neonatology and Pediatric Intensive Care Medicine at the Medical University of Vienna. And Nadia is also a researcher in the Department of Clinical Pharmacology, a senior consultant for neonatology and pediatrics and heads up the neonatal nutrition research team at the Medical University of Vienna. She's recently been elected as a Committee of Nutrition member for the Espergan Committee and is head of the Austrian Pediatric Nutrition Committee for the Austrian Pediatric Society. She sits on the editorial board of both Nutrients and Frontiers in Nutrition. And her interests are broadly in the areas of enteral and parental nutrition, but also the importance of human milk. And Professor Hayden is gonna be talking about post-discharge nutrition, particularly the importance of breastfeeding the introduction of complementary foods, but also aspects of eating behavior and feeding problems in infancy. Thank you. Say hello and send a very warm welcome to all the people listening at their screens in their home offices and hospitals. Unfortunately, we can't meet each other this year, um, but I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers for the invitation to give a talk on post-discharge nutrition uh, of preterm infants. So first of all, um, what are the challenges uh, for preterm infants at discharge? As a consequence of prematurity, these infants generally have limited nutrient reserves since they have not been able to take advantage of crucial last trimester, third trimester of pregnancy. This is a period during which there is transfer and accumulation of nutrients from the mother to the fetus associated with rapid growth. So preterm infants have a high need for nutrients on the one hand and the organ immaturity on the other hand, which contributes to difficulty of achieving dietary intakes that can allow these infants to have adequate growth. There are also at high risk for feeding problems, including a delayed developmental 
development of feeding skills, like you can see here now. You can see here uh, a preterm infant uh, around discharge, um, and he's much sleepier than a term infant, um, have difficulties in, in latching, uh, sucking and swallowing coordination. Additionally, the preterm population is extraordinarily diversified, encompassing babies with persistent morbidities, for example, chronic lung disease and short bowel syndrome. These infants have not high nutritional requirements and or the, uh, the need to limit the volume of feeds um, consumed. Finally, preterm infants are, tend to be discharged before hospital uh, earlier than the expected term. Uh, in 2006, the ASPIGAN published recommendations for post-discharge nutrition and distinguished between four postnatal or rather post-discharge growth pattern. Uh, here on the slide, you can see the first growth pattern for adequate growth. That means that the infant is born above the 10th percentile and discharged above the 10th percentile. Second growth pattern is catch-up growth. Infant is born below the 10th percentile and during the course in the neonatal intensive care unit, infant has catch-up growth and is discharged above the 10th percentile. The third growth pattern is extra uterine growth retardation. This is very common in infants with a very complicated neonatal course during their stay in the neonatal intensive care unit. So infant is born um, uh, above the 10th percentile and then crosses the percentiles either uh, by two percentiles or it is discharged below the 10th percentile. The fourth growth pattern is no catch-up growth. Infant is born below the 10th percentile and discharged below the 10th percentile. So uh, who needs uh, a higher density of nutrients uh, after discharge? So at this chart, you have two patterns. You have the appropriate growth uh, co corresponding group one and two, uh, as you've seen before. These, dis dis these infants are discharged above the 10th percentile. And you have the second pattern. The, these are the infants who need catch-up growth. They are discharged uh, below the 10th percentile, and this corresponds to pattern three and four you've seen before. And then we have two possibilities. Uh, we can either feed fortified breast milk or post-discharge formula. And in infants with appropriate growth, we feed these uh, formulas or fortified breast milk until term. And in infants uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, the need for catch-up growth, we feed these enhanced nutrients up to the 52nd week of gestation, which is the corresponding third month corrected for term. What are the nutritional requirements, the special nutritional requirements of preterm infants? Well, preterm infants have a higher need for energy, protein, iron, but also for long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, zinc, calcium, selenium, but unfortunately no specific recommendations are available for the post-discharge area. Um, when you, um, this table shows you the nutritional requirements for selected nutrients for the stable growing preterm infant. And you can see that they have much higher uh, requirements than term infants. If you estimate a minimal daily intake of 140 mL per kilogram, breast milk alone, you can see it here in the first column, uh, breast milk alone can't cover these requirements. So breast milk needs to be fortified you can see um, the selected nutritional values here. Uh, if you do if you do 50% fortification, uh, you can nicely meet the requirements of the discharged preterm infants. If the mother uh, decided not to breastfeed or um, is not able to breastfeed, then post-discharge formula are available. The nutri nutritional content is lower than in preterm formula, but higher than in starter formulas that you can see here. So it's somehow in between preterm formula and starter formula. And these are the special formulas for discharge. Um, how long should we provide a higher density of nutrients by fortification or discharge formula? There are a lot of studies that show that providing a higher density of nutrients until term induced catch-up growth and also induced a better new developmental outcome. But how is the evidence after term? 
There are only a few high quality studies um, that summarized by this Cochrane review, including only 256 infants. Um, these, the trials differed slightly in the mechanics of delivering the multinutrient fortifier. Here in the first, uh, the first study by O'Connor published in 2008, infants received fortifier in about half of their daily intake of breast milk, whereas in the second uh, study, the Saharasian study published in 2011, the fortifier was given only once daily mixed up in 20 to 50 ml of milk. In both trials, the remaining feeds were either taken directly from the breast or as an unfortified express breast milk at libitum. The intervention was done for 12 weeks in both, in both studies. Meta-analysis of data from both trials did not find any statistical significant difference in growth parameters at three or four months uh, of corrected age. You can see here uh, the data for weight. Uh, and they did also find no, no statistical, statistical significant difference um, or head circumference or uh, length at 12 months of corrected age. You can see this here. So no difference in this weight data. Um, however, several studies have shown some uh, other advantages of the use of human milk fortification after discharge, such as better lung functions at six year, better anthropometric parameters in in the special group of preterms with a birth weight below of 1,250 gram up to one year of life and a better visual function. What about early diet and long-term neurodevelopmental outcome? This is a follow-up study of preterm born children who are randomized at 36 weeks corrected for uh, corrected age to either preterm formula, you can see this here, or term formula or a crossover group. The crossover group uh, received preterm formula until term and afterwards term formula. Uh, and the intervention was done for six months and childhood cognition was assessed using the short form of Wechsler intelligence scale for children, allowing computation of full scale intelligence quotient, you can see it in the first line here, and the sub items of verbal comprehension, freedom from distractibility, perceptual organization and processing speed. Uh, overall, the mean um, intelligence quotient was minus seven points below the standard mean scores uh, for term infants. Um, but it was not shown that there was any correlation between uh, the formula with the higher nutritional content uh, or the cognition outcome with 10 years. Importantly, the authors showed a strong uh, association of early infant growth and later cognition. You can see it here. Here are the same um, items from the Wechsler intelligence test. And uh, the, the association, there was multi multivariate association of growth with cognitive ability. And what you can see here that the infants who were growing better had a higher intelligence than the one with the, with the lower growth. So there is a, a correlation, uh, not between enhanced nutrients, but uh, between growth and later cognitive outcome at 10 years. Um, there, but there is a second issue that we call the breastfeeding paradoxon. This study assessed the relationship between breastfeeding at the time of discharge, weight gain during hospitalization and neurodevelopmental outcome. You can see here two large cohorts. This is the lift cohort, with 1,733 former preterm infants and the epipage cohort with 2,163 preterm infants. And breastfeeding at the time of discharge was 16 to 19%. You can see the breastfed infants here in this black uh, dots and lines and the formula feed fed ones in the, with the gray dots and lines. And breastfeeding was significantly associated with an increased risk of losing one weight set score during hospitalization. Uh, this was here, especially here. Um, uh, but uh, the infants uh, had a higher head circumference set scores uh, uh, at 1.5, at 0.5, and two years in the lift cohort. You can see this here and also with five years in the epipage cohort. 
So that means that um, breastfed infants do not grow that well during their stay in the, in the neonatal intensive care unit, uh, but afterwards um, they have a better growth, especially in head circumference. And there is also a correlation uh, between uh, neurodevelopmental outcome and breastfeeding, which you can see here. Uh, these are infants that were not breastfed, of course, in their neonatal, neonatal intensive care unit. And these were infants who were breast up to discharge, up to two months and after two months. Um, and what you can see that this is a nice correlation between the duration of breastfeeding and the later outcome measured by the Kaufmann uh, assessment developmental testing. What about the introduction of complementary food? Um, the European Food and Safety Authority says that the right time point of introducing complementary feeding is due to anatomical changes in the oral cavity, disappearance or diminishing of reflexes present at birth that coordinate sucking, swallowing and respiration and protect the infant from aspiration and choking and the development of cross motor skills, especially the head and trunk control to allow an improve, uh, improved movement of the jaw and fine motor skills. Um, most data regarding complementary feeding in preterm infants are reported in a few observational trials, which the one uh, you can see here by Silvia Farinov. This is an Italian study. But most of these studies were conducted before 2000 under different circumstances. And despite the wide variability in timing and quality of complementary feeding, the available studies document that preterm infants are introduced very early to solid foods. Um, this is a survey uh, where they uh, distinguished between uh, very small preterm infants born between 24 and 32 weeks and late preterm infants. And what you can see here is that the younger the infants were, the earlier uh, solid food was introduced in this observational uh, study. And this is also introduction of solids was also related to birth weight. The smallest infant with a birth weight below 1000 gram were the, one, were the ones that um, received solids very early around the 13th week corrected uh, for uh, age, which corresponds to third month. And um, introduction of solid was also related to breast milk feeding or formula feeding. Formula fed infants were introduced uh, much earlier with solids than uh, breastfed infants. Uh, what uh, is the type of complementary food in preterm infants? Uh, it's the, more or less the same uh, like in term infants. Usually parents start with fresh fruits and vegetables then followed by cereals, meat, uh, milk products, fish around seven months, eggs around eight to nine months, and salt and sugar after the first year of life. What about prospective uh, randomized control trial? There is only one high quality randomized control trial conducted in India. Um, and this uh, trial was conducted in mostly large preterm infants with a gestational age around 32 weeks um, and a birth weight uh, around 1,500 grams. And primary outcome of this study was uh, set scores in weight with one year of age. And you can see here uh, in the blue line, the, the solids were introduced at four months of age. And in the red line, the solids were introduced at six months of age and there was absolutely no difference in uh, outcome, in weight, out, in anthropometric outcome, weight set scores um, with one year. Uh, it is remarkable that there's an inevitable loss in set scores uh, during the stay in the, in, the, in the neonatal intensive care unit and up to term, approximately about minus 2.8 uh, minus in set score, and with one year still minus uh, 1.6 in set score, with this, which is really remarkable. Uh, I'd like to present uh, your unpublished data from my own group. Um, we did a prospective randomized control trial where we introduced early complementary feeding in preterm infants below uh, between the 10th and 12th week of gestation or in the late group between 16 and 18 week of gestation. And the infants had to adhere to an absolute, absolutely standardized uh, diet. They received feeding boxes from us with uh, fruits, vegetables, cereals, 
and they had to strictly adhere only to this diet and were not allowed uh, to uh, eat anything else. So our patients uh, with a mean gestational age about around 27 weeks of gestation and their mean birth weight was uh, around 950 grams in both groups. So they were much smaller than the infants in the Indian trial. And uh, our primary outcome was uh, length with one year. And you can see here in the, with the red lines, the early group and with the blue lines, uh, the late group. And here the set scores for weight and uh, length. And you can see in primary outcome, absolutely no difference between early and late introduction of solids between two groups. We had a slightly difference in Z scores in uh, weight um, at six months, but this was not consistent. And here are the data for head circumference, no, 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 no difference, and also for BMI. Um, and you, you can see here also that uh, our drop in set scores was at a maximum of yeah, 0.2. Um, and this is also a difference uh, to the Indian study where we had much uh, larger uh, drops in set scores. What about feeding problems and eating behavior? Uh, a remarkable number of infants uh, have, preterm infants have uh, problems in, uh, with uh, eating uh, behavior. Uh, this is related to their intrinsic immaturity, neurological deficits, comorbidities, and um, also to unpleasant procedure the infants had to undergo during the hospitalization, for example, tube feeding or intubation. Um, uh, a remarkable group of infants are discharged on tube feeding, 15 to 23% uh, of the infants born below 29 weeks of gestation are discharged on tube feeding. And concerning the feeding problems, uh, this is a study uh, where questionnaires were sent out to uh, parents of early and late preterm infants at, as you can see here, the early group and the late group at three, six and 12 months. And the parents were asked for perception of infants feeding skills, comfort with feeding, hospital, hospital uh, visits for feeding difficulties, uh, what were their observations. And what the authors found that um, preterm infants and especially the smaller ones uh, had a consistent problem with oromotor dysfunction during the first year of life. You can see it here in this, in this group. And uh, also during the first three months, uh, problems with avoidant behavior uh, of, uh, of bottle or breast or solids. So to summarize, what are the recent challenges in post-discharge nutrition? Uh, on, uh, on the one hand, we have the uh, post-discharge nutrition with the uh, breastfeeding paradox on the advantages of the use of human milk, the fortification possibility after discharge, and the challenges are to define entity and velocity of catch-up growth, what is the right catch-up growth, to individualize the nutritional approach, to define the nutritional requirements of the discharge period, and to consider the feeding skills and emotional factors of uh, parents and preterm infants. And during the weaning time where solids are introduced, we have here this growth standards uh, up to 52 to 64 weeks uh, postmenstrual age and the weaning period between four and six months. And the challenges are again to avoid the risk of postnatal growth deviation, to individualize the nutritional approach, to consider feeding skills and emotional factors of infants and parents, and to consider the acceptance of semi-solid foods and micronutrient intake. So to conclude, the available data suggests that there is no specific timing which applies safely to all the preterm infants concerning introduction of solids. Uh, who constitutes an extremely variable population in terms of achievement of developmental milestones and oral skills. For this reason, we propose that complementary feeding in preterm infants should be introduced uh, following an individualized evaluation, mainly based on the infant's development rather than corrected or postnatal age. Uh, and I'd like to finish my talk with this uh, nice little guy and the successful introduction of Solace and thank you for your attention.
Our last speaker in the session is Professor Nina Modi, who is Professor of Neonatal Medicine at Imperial College London, and also a consultant in neonatal medicine at Chelsea and Westminster NHS Foundation Trust. Nina is a very well-known and respected speaker and is also uh, a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences, a very prestigious honor in the whole field of medicine. She has a very strong national and international profile as a medical leader and clinical scientist and has headed up the research group at Imperial and led the development of the neonatal data analysis unit and manages the national neonatal research database in the UK. She's chaired the BMJ Ethics Committee and serves on a number of research committees and working groups. Nina is also the current president of the UK Medical Women's uh, Federation and was the immediate past president of the UK Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health and is president-elect of the British Medical Association. She leads a research group that has very broad interests looking at the impact of perinatal factors, for example, motor delivery nutrition on long life health and well-being in preterm infants. And as I say, the group has a major focus in using routinely recorded clinical data to improve outcomes and support research studies in this area. She has over 350 publications, including over 200 original research papers. And Professor Modi is gonna be talking today on the quality of growth, body composition, and longer term metabolic outcomes in preterm infants. Thank you. I've been asked to speak to you about quality of growth, body composition, and longer term metabolic outcomes. My name is Nina Modi. I'm a neonatologist at Imperial College London. And let me give you a brief summary of my talk because we only have 20 minutes. So I will be covering uh, body composition as a biomarker of metabolic risk. I will briefly then talk about the long-term metabolic outcomes of preterm infants. And finally, I'll speak about what is currently known about influences upon infant body composition. So first of all, I want to really, really impress upon you that body composition is a, a superior biomarker of metabolic risk in adults than is a body mass index. And it's important to recognize this uh, and it's illustrated by this famous picture here, which was published in The Lancet way back in 2004, which has two um, clini clinician scientists. Uh, you will see John Yudkin on the, on the left and Chitranjan Yajnik, who is an Indian scientist from, on the right. Now, they both have a very similar height, a very similar build, and you'll see that John's BMI is 22.3 and Ranjan's BMI is 22.3. But when they measured their body fat, their body fat content is very different. John's is just under 10, he's very lean. And Chitranjan, although he's very slim, has a, a body fat content of over 20%. So this shows us why body mass index alone can be very misleading. Body mass index is a marker of metabolic risk only at the upper and the very lower ends of BMI. But for the range in the middle, it is not a good biomarker. And this is why attention has turned to body composition. Now, the other, uh, another example of why body composition can be an important biomarker for altered metabolism in adults is summarized in this slide here. So this is a Canadian research paper from 2006, but there are many such papers. And in the diagram, you will see here on the vertical axis, the risk of death on the horizontal axis, the amount of internal abdominal adipose tissue, visceral adipose tissue. And this participant in this study here, participant B, who um, has got a twofold higher risk for mortality than participant A, and participant B has got double the amount of intra-abdominal adipose tissue. You will see this single slice CT scan showing participant B's intra-abdominal adipose tissue color-coded in red, showing much, much more than participant A. So the distribution of adipose tissue is also a marker of um, altered metabolism and metabolic risk. But that, however, is in adults. Now, I'm going to move to the next part of my talk, which is about the adult phenotype of the very preterm infant. And again, uh, a decade ago, we published some research in pediatric research, which compared young 
outwardly healthy adults who were born below 20, 32 weeks gestation and compared them with full-term healthy adults, young adults. And what we found was that the men who had been born preterm had an average increase of around half a kilo in internal abdominal adipose tissue. We also found that their hepatic lipid content was three times higher than term-born counterparts, and they had an increase in blood pressure. And although the preterm individuals had a lower body mass index, their waist-hip ratio was higher. And of course, that would be in keeping with them having a higher internal abdominal adipose tissue. So this suggested to us that perhaps young adults who had been born preterm would be at higher risk of cardiometabolic complications. But we concluded from that, those studies that preterm adults appear to have a body composition phenotype indicative of metabolic risk. So we next asked the question, what evidence is there of um, altered metabolic risk in young adults born preterm? This is a systematic review and meta-analysis we published in 2013, which shows that adult systolic and diastolic blood pressure is higher in individuals born uh, prematurely. And this shows you that they have on average a 4.2 millimeter increase in systolic blood pressure, and on average a two and a half millimeter increase in diastolic blood pressure. And these are very substantial in, in increases. There are data from around the world too that show increased risk for preterm adult individuals in childhood and later life. So here you've got some data from uh, showing the risk of ischemic heart disease, which is inversely related with gestational age. This comes from Casey Crump study in 2019, published in JAMA Pediatrics. The, um, again, the vertical line shows the adjusted hazard ratio for ischemic heart disease. The orange line marks that for preterm individuals. And you will see that this is substantially increased over full-term individuals, which is the black horizontal line shown here. You can see other data. This is data for preterm individuals and their risk of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Again, this is data from Casey Crump's group. Um, on the left here, you'll see the adjusted hazard ratio for type 1 diabetes with this red line showing less than 34 weeks gestation individuals. This is, um, this is uh, for females. And the red dotted line showing males here, showing an increased hazard ratio over full-term individuals. And similarly, a very much increased hazard ratio for type 2 diabetes as well. So preterm births associated with approximately 1.2, 1.3-fold increased risk for type 1 and type 2 diabetes at the age of uh, under 18 years. Now, metabolic syndrome is also higher in adults born preterm. These are data, um, these are data from Finland. You can see here the prevalence of hypertension, obesity, metabolic syndrome, and fatty liver index, raised fatty liver index in early preterm individuals in the dark bars, um, late preterm in the ha hashed bars, and controls in the white bars, again showing their increased risk. And if you're interested in reading more about this, please go to the Neonatal Update Special Edition of Early Human Development, November 2020 which summarizes the risks for preterm individuals in adult life. So the summary of that second part of my talk is that preterm individuals are at greater risk of a range of cardiometabolic disorders and other chronic long-term conditions, including reduced lifespan. Now, what influences are known uh, uh, upon infant body composition? Well, a large body of literature shows that infant adiposity and infant body composition is influenced by sex, birth gestational age, whether or not the, child, the infant is breast or formula fed, their protein intake, their maternal adiposity, whether their mothers had gestational diabetes and their ethnicity. And very briefly, I will show you um, some of the data uh, in relation to these influences. So first of all, some data from my own research group, which goes back to 2005. This was a study in which we used whole body magnetic resonance imaging, um, uh, taking images of the baby sequentially, sliced through the body as it were. And we showed that there was increased internal abdominal adipose tissue in 
<laughs> excuse me, excuse me. There was increased internal abdominal adipose tissue in preterm infants when they reached the age of full term. And that was published in Pediatric Research in 2005. So outwardly, these pre, very preterm babies at the age of term equivalent looked very thin. But if you measured their body composition using whole body MRI, you found that they had an increase in internal abdominal adipose tissue. We also found using uh, liver spectroscopy, proton spectroscopy, that intrahepatocellular lipid is increased in the preterm and term infant. And we replicated that in a number of studies. So you can see here, um, uh, the first panel shows a very small fat peak in full-term babies and a much higher fat peak in preterm and term individuals. And I repeat again that intra-abdominal adipose tissue and increased liver fat are risk factors for later onset metabolic conditions. Now, what about the effects of formula feeding versus breastfeeding? Well, we published a systematic review and meta-analysis in 2012. And here we've plotted on the y-axis the differences in fat mass, so in adiposity, this is on the y-axis, against age up to the age of one year. So this is aging days up to the age of one year. And the remember, higher, higher fat mass in formula-fed infants will be shown by a vertical line above this horizontal and lower um, fat mass in formula-fed infants will be shown below the line. And what you can see is that formula-fed infants have got a lower fat mass than breastfed infants at three to four months and six months, but then there is a reversal by 12 months and the difference is no longer apparent and there appears to be a trend towards a higher fat mass in formula-fed infants. Now, we also showed that uh, fat-free mass, this is fat-free mass displayed in exactly the same way, sh um, showing that formula-fed infants have a higher fat-free mass throughout infancy than breastfed infants. So very intriguing data, which, don't pre which present a complex picture. Let's turn to some other data. So this is a randomized controlled trial, so very strong data indeed but this is in full-term babies. And this was the Childhood Obesity, the Pan-European Childhood Obesity Project, which was a randomized controlled trial enrolling healthy full-term infants, randomizing them to receive a higher protein or a lower protein formula in the first year. And the data that have emerged from this study are extremely interesting. I re recommend you read the papers, but the summary is that infant formula with a lower protein content, reduced body mass index and obesity risk at school age. So suggesting now that a lower protein content than was formerly used in, in formula products for full-term babies was protective against obesity. Um, and um, what we've also done is some studies showing the influence now of maternal body mass index on infant adiposity and hepatic lipid content. And again, because time is tight, in summary, I can say that infant adiposity and hepatic lipid increase across the normal range of maternal BMI. In other words, the more obese a mother is, the more adipose tissue her baby is going to have, and the more hepatic lipid her baby is going to have. What about mothers with gestational diabetes, which is a rising problem throughout the world? Well, again, we did an observational study comparing babies born to mothers with gestational diabetes and babies uh, born to healthy mothers. And the summary results are shown here. There were no differences in body composition at birth. And again, we studied body composition using whole body MRI. But by the age of three months, total adipose tissue was greater in the babies born to the mothers with gestational diabetes. And it was quite a substantial difference of 16%. We, all, we also curiously found that uh, this was the case, even though these mothers had very good glycemic control. They did not have an increased body mass index um, and they predominantly breastfed. In other words, showing that breastfeeding does not appear to protect babies born to mothers with gestational diabetes from developing increased adiposity. And finally, I would like to just show you some data, summarize some data where we compared Infant adiposity, these were healthy full-term babies born to either white Caucasian mothers in London 
all to Asian Indian mothers in London. So the mothers were healthy, the babies were healthy, but the Asian Indian ba newborn babies in comparison with their white European counterparts had significantly greater absolute adiposity in all compartments, uh, all abdominal compartments, despite the similar whole adipose tissue content. And so we suggested, and you can read this paper in pediatric research, we suggested that there are differences in adipose tissue partitioning by ethnicity, which are apparent at birth. So let me end with the question, is infant body composition a biomarker of later cardiometabolic risk? And the answer is um, that although childhood and adult body composition is a biomarker of metabolic risk, we still don't know whether um, body composition in infancy is a biomarker for later risk. So we need, in order to answer this question, we need a study of longitudinal cohorts to determine the predictive value of infant body composition on long-term health and also to establish the extent to which body composition tracks through infancy into adult life. And finally, we need a lot longitudinal studies to address the impact of infant nutrition on body composition and on later metabolic outcomes, taking into account the many known confounding factors that I have explained to you. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'm sorry this has been such a rush because we have very short time but I'd like to end with recommending you read the references I've mentioned. And also I would like to invite you to join the Neonatal Update 2021. Uh, this is a flagship meeting of Imperial College London discussing the science of newborn care. It will be held between November 23rd and December 3rd. And if you go to our website, you will find further information about the Neonatal Update. So many thanks indeed for listening to me. And that brings me to the end of my talk. <laughs>